Welcome to iFormRx, where we explore the evidence that informs ambulatory care pharmacy practice. In this vidcast, we'll be reviewing the DePrescribe study, which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in November of 2018. Our reviewer today is Dr. Christine Demakuligan, who is a PGY-2 ambulatory care pharmacy practice resident at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. And joining her are our expert panelists, Dr. Emily Prohaska and Dr. Nikki Brandt. Thank you, Stuart. We all know that medications can cure and alleviate suffering, but they can also cause significant harm, especially in our older adults, because they are more vulnerable to adverse effects and likely to be taking multiple medications. Adverse effects due to medications in older adults is only going to become a bigger concern in years to come. Our older population is growing at an exponential rate, upwards of about almost 100 million adults by the year 2060, We are seeing a lot of our older patients in the workforce, and they make up a substantial amount of our diverse patient population. One study actually reported that 30% of older adults in the United States are taking five or more drugs simultaneously, and the use of multiple medications is largely driven by the number of comorbidities, which increase as we age. So the first step really in combating this concern is by talking about the prescribing in our older adults. This may not completely remove the risk, but it does reduce the risk of frailty, which is increased vulnerability, poor sense of balance, and increased risk of falls. There's an overall concern of patient safety, and as the quote-unquote medication experts, our job is to decrease exposure to medications, not just for this population, but for all populations. Medications that have no indication are no longer appropriate and or no longer align with the patient's goals. According to an article from the American Family Physician, adverse drug events occur in 15% of older adults presenting to offices, hospitals, and extended care facilities. Many of these adverse drug events in the outpatient setting are completely preventable. So let's talk about PIMS, or potentially inappropriate medications, and their concern for our elderly patient population. There are many, many tools out there that are used to help identify PIMS, and as you'll see, some are listed here. The one we'll probably be talking most about today, or more in detail about today, is the Beers criteria. The stop and the start criteria are often used in the same sentence. Similar to the Beers criteria, the stop, or otherwise known as the screening tool of older people's potentially inappropriate prescriptions, and the start, otherwise known as the screening tool, to alert doctors to write treatments, are aimed to provide explicit evidence-based rules of avoidance and potentially inappropriate medications for the elderly. But unlike the Beers criteria, the stop and start criteria will provide guidance in terms of alternatives and maximum doses for this patient population. Choosing Wisely is an initiative brought forth by the ABIM Foundation in hopes to promote conversations between clinicians and patients by really helping patients choose care that is, one, evidence-based, two, not duplicative of other tests or procedures already received, three, free from harm, and four, truly unnecessary. This tool is also available via an application through smartphones, so it's accessible for patients as well as their providers. The last tool mentioned here, but is not the only tool left for this patient population, is the website deprescribing.org. This was a website that was developed by Dr. Barbara Farrell and Dr. Kara Tenenbaum, a pharmacist and physician who work with geriatric patient populations and are concerned about medications prescribed in this patient population. This research is based in Canada, and this website not only provides PIMS, but also algorithms and guidelines with which to discontinue or taper off patients on these medications. Let's get started talking about the trial itself. The deprescribed trial was a cluster randomized trial in the setting of community pharmacies that was done primarily in Quebec, Canada. The gist of this study's objective was to compare the discontinuation of medications with pharmacist-led intervention versus current common practice otherwise known as no pharmacist intervention at all. The study included older adults at least 65 years or older, those who have had their prescriptions filled for one of the four target medications for at least three consecutive months. The four target medications were benzodiazepines, first-generation antihistamines, glyburide, or selective NSAIDs. Patients were excluded if they had severe mental illness or dementia. They also excluded patients who had significant cognitive impairment, patients who were not able to communicate in English or in French, since this was a study that was done primarily in Canada, 
as well as patients who are living in an assisted living facility. Please note that the patients were not randomized, but the pharmacies were cluster randomized in order to deter any confounders from being present. In terms of how the intervention took place, the pharmacist recognizes the inappropriate prescription, and when it's identified the pharmacist similar to common practice, will relay information to both the patient about deprescribing and also provide a recommendation to the physician. The patient will read the information the pharmacist provides via brochure, and the provider will also evaluate the recommendation that was received by the pharmacist. The idea is that this is a multimodal approach where the patient is included in the decision-making process. Patients were not just told about the intervention, but they were provided a drug-specific brochure. Patients were either provided this in person or by mail, and for those who were prescribed sedative hypnotics, they were also provided information about the tapering process. The provider was notified of the pharmacist's recommendation. They often refer to this part of the study as the pharmaceutical opinion, which is a legal and reimbursable recommendation or act in Canada. So as mentioned before, we're looking at prescription fills and not necessarily use of the medication. The study looked at the non-fills of the medications for at least six months after randomization of the identified pharmacies. As you can see, there are numerous secondary outcomes, and some of them are in regards to behaviors of the patients and or participants, and others are outcome-based, such as the delivery of the brochure to the patients and whether tapering occurred for those patients who are identified as being on a sedative hypnotic. There were 69 pharmacies that were randomized, and relatively the same amount of patients were included in each of the treatment groups, treatment and control. Just as a reminder, the pharmacies were randomized, which was an ethical method to randomize the patients that were ultimately included in this trial. Of note, no pharmacies withdrew from this trial, which meant that all of the pharmacies were included from the initial randomization, and there were no dropouts. When we look at the baseline characteristics, more than half of this trial included females for both the treatment as well as the control group. Patients were on average 75 years old, and almost half of the patients graduated from college or had a university education. Most of the patients reported that they had quote-unquote good health, while a quarter of patients reported that they were quote-unquote frail. And of note, most of the patients did present with an MMSC score of 29, which meant that most patients had normal MMSC. When we look at the medications that were identified in this trial, you'll note that most of the patients in this trial were on sedative hypnotics. You'll also note that between the control and interventional groups, there was a similar number of patients that were enrolled between the two groups, regardless of the drug class. In terms of discontinuation of medications, the number needed to treat was three people. And this meant that three people needed to be educated on this deprescribing initiative in order to have one person actually discontinue the identified potentially inappropriate medication. When we're discussing the secondary outcomes, I would like to draw your attention to those who are being tapered off of the sedative hypnotics. Note that most patients were told about the deprescribing of these specific medications, and of those that were identified, more than half of the patients actually initiated their tapering. Of those patients that initiated tapering, three-fourths of the patients actually discontinued the medication altogether. Some of the strengths identified of this trial was that patients were involved in the process just as much as the providers were, and it was done in an accessible setting such as a community pharmacy. On the flip side of that, some of the limitations that were identified was the limited follow-up time period. But before we get into too much detail with critiquing this trial, Let's first introduce our amazing panelists who we have the honor of joining us today. So I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Nicole Brandt and Dr. Emily Prohaska as our panelists today to discuss the Deprescribe study. Dr. Brandt is currently the Executive Director of the Peter Lamy Center on Drug Therapy and Aging and Professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Prohaska is employed as a Clinical Services Coordinator with Balls Food Stores in Kansas City, Kansas and is the site preceptor for the PGY-1 Community Pharmacy Residency. Dr. Brandt and Dr. Prohaska are both board-certified geriatric pharmacy specialists. Welcome. So let's first start off our discussion by asking the both of you what you believe are the key strengths of the Deprescribe trial. Some of the key strengths, in my opinion, of the Deprescribe trial was that it was a focused, systematic approach, which Deprescribe implies in the process, that truly engaged both patients as well as providers in the process. 
The other strength uh, was that it engaged the community pharmacist as part of the interprofessional team, focusing on some potentially high-risk medications in older adults. I found the design of cluster randomization as well as the inclusion and exclusion criteria to be strengths of this trial as the subjects in the study were representative of a community dwelling population that a typical community pharmacy would provide care for. Measuring the outcome of the intervention after a six month period was also a strength as this time frame allowed patients and caregivers time to speak with their provider and taper or switch off of medication of concern. Waiting six months also would potentially capture any patients who attempted to taper off one of the medications but did not succeed. I found the process evaluation section of the results to be a particular strength of this study. I was pleasantly surprised to see that almost 80% of patients reported discussing the deprescribing intervention with their prescriber. In summary, I found this to be a realistic, well-designed study with promising findings that could be more broadly applied to community pharmacies in the United States. Conversely, were there any limitations or confounders that might have influenced the results of the deprescribed trial? I found it interesting that the study authors chose to only take action on the first drug that appeared on the intervention list if a patient was taking multiple medications of concern. Although I can appreciate why this decision was made from a statistical analysis standpoint, I was curious to know how many patients were taking multiple potentially inappropriate medications. I would also want to know what type of training was provided to the pharmacy teams involved in the intervention arm of the study, as some pharmacy locations and or individual pharmacists might have been stronger advocates for the intervention versus others. The authors note that there was a monetary incentive provided for sending pharmaceutical opinions, which could have also influenced the actions taken by pharmacists. To add to the limitations or confounders that have already been discussed, when we look at the baseline demographic of the population targeting community dwelling older adults, I was a little concerned about the generalizability due to the level of education. I was also concerned about the generalizability to individuals with maybe early onset cognitive disorders that are residing within the community still trying to manage their medications and might also be at greater risk for experiencing some of the adverse effects from these medications, especially the first-generation antihistamines. Uh, the other exclusion criteria were those with mental illness, which again is a population that we still need to include in programs because of their risk of having adverse events. And I think it also would have been helpful to look at the multiple medications being used um, in a meaningful way and how the pharmacist prioritized some of those recommendations. So the intervention in the study was centered on educating both prescribers and patients. How feasible is this kind of intervention to implement in community practice today? From my perspective, I think that, again, a focused, systematic approach engaging both patients as well as providers that was done in this Canadian-based study can be generalized to pharmacies in America. And in many ways, I feel that this program parallels what we are doing with medication therapy management. In particular, because of the focus nature of the medications they were looking at, I believe that this type of design could be used in a more meaningful way for targeted medication reviews, which are currently reimbursed by Medicare Part D plans, but honestly have been conducted in multiple methods, from faxes to providers to phone calls by pharmacies. So I think that findings from studies like Deprescribe could inform some of the process changes within our own programs here based in community pharmacies. I also think, just looking at the educational angle, I think it's really important to have consistent educational materials that send a similar message at an appropriate educational level, and ideally in another language, as was mentioned in the study, they had to speak both English and French, which also speaks to the importance of understanding the patients that we serve. I reviewed the educational materials provided to patients in this study and found them to be of good quality. Although long, between 10 and 15 pages, there was a wealth of information contained in the handout, including a quiz about the benefits and harms of the medication, links to other resources for non-pharmacologic interventions, 
patient success stories about how individuals were able to taper or switch off the medication of concern, and a specific tapering schedule to discuss with the prescriber when appropriate. I think that for this type of intervention to be successful in community pharmacies in the United States, the handouts would have to be one to two pages in length to begin an initial conversation with the patient or caregiver. This would likely not be a one and done intervention, but rather several touch points over time. Another difference would be the home-based visits. This is not something the infrastructure of most community pharmacies could support from a resource perspective. I do believe that pharmacies using the appointment-based model for medication synchronization, in which a patient comes in on a set day of the month to pick up all of their maintenance medications, could easily fit this type of intervention into their workflow as a targeted initiative. Pharmacists or pharmacy personnel could also administer the questionnaires used in the trial, such as the short form 12 item health survey or 13 item vulnerable elder survey while the patient is at the pharmacy. There is growing momentum right now for the formation of community pharmacy networks that provide enhanced patient care services above and beyond traditional dispensing. A deprescribing intervention focused on eliminating potentially inappropriate medications would be well aligned with the types of services these pharmacies are committed to providing. So as a follow-up, do you think collaborative practice agreements have a feasible role in the community pharmacy setting? Yes, I do believe that deprescribing initiatives would be an excellent component of collaborative practice agreements. However, laws for collaborative practice agreements vary widely between states. For example, in Kansas, where I practice, the CPA regulations require that a patient have an established relationship with the provider and the pharmacist must have an agreement with the patient's prescriber to manage their medication. I work in a metropolitan area and our patients see quite literally hundreds of physicians. So logistically, entering into CPAs with all of the various practices and prescribers would be quite difficult. However, some community practices may be located in rural areas or in very close proximity with a physician group that may generate the majority of the prescriptions filled by that pharmacy, and so CPAs would easily be achievable in those circumstances. So this trial focused on four major drug or drug classes in the older adult population. What are some other medications that you often see being deprescribed in the community or ambulatory care setting that was not mentioned in this trial? One of the medications that's available over-the-counter as well as prescribed a fair amount that we've done a lot of due diligence with in an ambulatory care setting is proton pump inhibitors. Again, we know from the literature that proton pump inhibitors are often inappropriately prescribed uh, during transitions of care and not reevaluated. So within our practice setting, we did an internal review of the number of patients on proton pump inhibitors and found about 50% of our patients were taking them. And then we did a concerted effort, very much like the authors in this study, to engage the caregiver, patient, and the prescriber in de-escalating, de-prescribing the medication. So I think proton pump inhibitors have gotten a lot of attention uh, with de-prescribing initiatives. There's also been increasing attention to deprescribing agents like opioids. And I believe that, again, pharmacists can play a key role in systematically approaching patients and providers in a meaningful way to reduce the dose as well as monitor for the emergence of adverse drug withdrawal events. And even within this deprescribed study, they talked more about the success of de-escalating, de-prescribing benzodiazepines over time with some of the additional educational tools that they've evolved and developed. Many, many thanks again to Dr. Brandt and Dr. Prohaska in the discussion of this trial. And in summary, the de-prescribed study suggests that pharmacist-led educational intervention on de-prescribing potentially inappropriate medications could make a positive impact on our elderly patient population. What are your thoughts on the deprescribed trial? How can we better implement these changes in the community and ambulatory care practice? We would love to hear your thoughts and welcome your comments. Thanks for listening.